Hi, good afternoon, everyone. It's John Snyder here, sitting here on Thursday, rainy Thursday afternoon, another edition of Newton Wellesley Medical Group Lunch and Learn. We are pleased to um, welcome back Dr. Lori Katz uh, to talk to us about patella instability. Um, before we do that, we just want to tease our upcoming Lunch and Learns. Next week, we have uh, Dr. Sean Rocket talking to us about shoulder pain. So we have back-to-back -back orthopedic talks. And then we have Dr. Larry Friedman talking to us about abnormal liver function tests. And then on Thursday, we have what a pain in the leg, um, a, a new change there on April 14th. And then we'll be off on the 21st for school vacation week. We want to remind folks that these talks are all archived up on the intranet. And there's the link there as well as up on YouTube. And you're welcome to view these um, later at your viewing pleasure. Um, we also, a um, couple of programs we want to make sure folks are taking advantage of. First is the Shipley Fitness Center is still open free for any employee all the way through Wednesday, June 1st. Please come check out the Shipley Fitness Center. Can't complain. The hours are good. They're open from 430 to 10. So plenty of time during the day. And even on the weekends, five to six, please come and enjoy um, and check out the services here at Shipley. And if we get a lot, continuing more people to use it, maybe we can even convince the hospital to keep it free. So let's keep using it and, and check out the Shipley Fitness Center. Dan Destin would be happy to talk to you about the different programs there. Um, we also want to remind that this, this uh, benefit at the Physician Care Concierge will come to an end in November 2022. This is a free service for you. Um, think of this as an interactive Angie's list, looking for something to be done around your house, looking for a suggestion of a gift or a trip. Um, this is all available to you. All you need to do is line, sign up under um, community.circles.com. Please make sure you use that link. If you Google um, community circles, you're gonna get a different website that won't work, community.circles.com. Register with the welcome code NWH. We also remind folks that it's a plus one access. You can add a spouse, partner, relative, or friend to your account. It's great, um, non, it's non-intrusive, and they will find two or three people or two or three services for anything you're asking for, from uh, moving from moving your teenager out of your house to mowing your lawn or shoveling your snow. Um, we, this is definitely a program we wanna remind folks. We have uh, Doctor's Day is coming up, March 30th. We welcome everyone back to the hospital. Come on by and pick up your free water bottle branded with our new branding. Um, also a $10 cafeteria gift certificate. So come have breakfast with us, pick up your bottle. We'll be there all day, and I'll be there a part of the day handing out these bottles, uh, bowls four to five conference room. You guys remember where bowls is? Come on back. We'd love to have you back up on the hospital campus and to say hello. Also, at the same time, if your doctor photo needs updating, please, we did uh, pay, and we will have a professional photographer there to take individual portraits. You're welcome to sign up for a time, while we will take walk-ins as well. A lot of us have taken advantage of this to update our photos as we continue to push our web presence. And also you can see your photos now are on Epic. And by the way, your patients can see your photos. If your photo looks like your wedding photo from 30 years ago, time to update it, folks. Let's get, get in and you can wear something professional that day and come on in and we'll take your picture. And I will turn it over to Lori. Lori, make sure you unmute yourself, Lori. Thank you. There you go. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Okay, perfect. Um, please bear with us today because some, I had some videos embedded and unfortunately they won't work from my computer from the hospital. So Dr. Snyder is going to be controlling the slides. So we may have a little back and forth, but we'll do our best uh, to keep it flowing. I'm gonna speak to you today about patella instability. I really didn't think about the complexity of this topic when I offered it as far as anatomy and um, biomechanics, but hopefully I've presented in a way that you'll all take something away from today's talk, um, knowing more than you did before. So again, my name is Lori Katz. I did my residency at the Tufts Combined Orthopedics Program. I then did a sports medicine fellowship at New England Baptist Hospital. I'm board certified in orthopedic surgery, and I also hold a subspecialty certificate in orthopedic sports medicine. My specialty is arthroscopic surgery of the shoulder and the knee. I'm part of Newton Wellesley Orthopedic Associates. We have three locations, one at Newton Wellesley Hospital in the White Building. Then we have two satellite offices just down the street in Wellesley. Um, you can send referrals directly to our office uh, by having your patients call the number on the screen. You can also do an EPIC referral where the information is listed below. So an overview of today's talk, uh, we're gonna go over a little bit of the anatomy of the patella femoral joint as it applies to patella instability. We're also gonna talk about mechanisms of injury, how to care for these in the acute setting, 
And then through the use of cases, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the history, the physical exam, the imaging and the treatment. So for the anatomy perspective, there's both soft tissue and bony um, restraints that are involved. So the first one is the quadriceps tendon, and you can see I have it circled here. Uh, the quadricep is obviously attached to four muscles. The kind of overall pull of the quadriceps is actually more in a lateral direction. So you can see the arrow that I put on the screen there. And basically it's just showing that the quadriceps, the overall net force is more laterally. So the patella is already at a little bit of a disadvantage from that in that it wants to shift more towards the outside. Next, we have the patella tendon. Uh, that's pretty important for this because that attaches from the patella down to the tibial tubercle. And we're gonna get a little more into that in a couple of slides. Um, the next one, the medial patella femoral ligament. This is probably one of the most important ligaments that we're gonna talk about today. And you're going to hear it over and over again. Uh, we refer to it as the MPFL, just to make it easier. And this is a static ligament, meaning it doesn't pull on the patella, it's just there to hold it in place. We actually call it a check rein. And I always think of that because it, it really keeps the patella in check. It just prevents it from shifting out in the other direction, in the lateral direction. And then it's not shown on this image, but there is also a balancing lateral patellofemoral ligament. Um, but that doesn't, again, doesn't pull on the patella. It just kind of tries to hold it in place. Next. <laughs> Um, so the next thing is to talk about some bony considerations. So the trochlear groove, I don't know, can you guys see my cursor, John, or no? No, okay, because you're controlling it, okay. That's okay. So the trochlear groove is the little sulcus in that, in that um, MRI that we have there where the patella is kind of articulating with. So it's the, yes, there we go. <laughs> he knows his anatomy. Uh, the trochlear groove is basically the end of the femur bone on the anterior aspect. And it's supposed to have a contour to it. So if you look at that, you can see it is almost like a V-shaped where the patella kind of seems like it locks into it. When you get to 30 degrees of a bend, your patella physically does get locked in by that V. So the articulation constrains the joint so when your knee is straight, you actually can move your patella side to side because it's not locked in. And then if you bend your knee to about 30 degrees, you'll notice that you can't move your patella anymore. And that's because it's basically locked in by the sulcus of the uh, trochlear groove. Next slide. Unfortunately, there is a problem though, where some people are born with a shallow trochlea or a dysplastic trochlea. And you can basically see where the top slide shows that V shape, this one is almost like a straight line on the bottom. So there's no real groove or sulcus for that patella to lock into. And the reason that matters is it's far past 30 degrees when that patella will actually be locked in by the bony constraints. So in order to make up for that, that medial patella femoral ligament, which John, if you can kind of point to the right of the patella, there's a structure, yeah, if you go down that, exactly, you got it. That's the medial patella femoral ligament. And that's actually holding the patella in place when it can't rely on the trochlear groove. Okay, so next we have our tibial tubercle. So the tibial tubercle is a prominence on the anterior tibia, which is where the patella tendon inserts. So in an ideal world, we can go to the next slide. In an ideal world, that tibial tubercle would be straight below the patella and straight below that trochlear groove. So that when we move our knee back and forth from bend, you know, flexion to extension, everything is very linear. Unfortunately, that's not the way it is in the real world. And if you wanna to go to the next slide, most of our tibial tubercles are shifted over to the lateral side. And so you can see from that second line that I just put up, the pull on the patella is actually gonna be more in a lateral direction, um, hence that black arrow. And how much pull is depending on how far lateral. So we actually can measure that on CT scan or MRI. We can actually drop a line, which would be the left line in this picture, from where our tubercle is centered. And then we kind of go across to where our trochlear groove is centered. 
And the difference between those two is what we call the tibial tubercle to trochlear groove distance. And it's basically a measure of how far over is your tubercle? Is it normal? Is it abnormal? So if you go to the next slide, anything less than 15 millimeters difference between where the tubercle is and the um, trochlear groove is normal. People's patella will pretty much glide central. Once you get over 20 degree, 20 millimeters or two centimeters, that's definitely abnormal. And you worry about those patients being at a higher risk for dislocations. And then there's the gray area in between. So as far as the mechanism of injury, the most common is a non-contact activity. So someone has their foot, ex excuse me, their knee extended, their foot is externally rotated and they twist their leg. And that's how the patella dislocates. Fortunately, in most of these cases, when this happens, your quadriceps has a reflexive contraction and the patella will self-reduce. Uh, the other possibility is a direct blow to the medial aspect of the knee, but this is much less common. So in the acute care setting, if these don't self-reduce, you want to do it manually and you want to do it as soon as possible just to pre prevent further damage to the joint. So here's a video, if we can make this work, of someone holding their knee flexed. You can see the patella is clearly dislocated. And what you wanna do is just slowly straighten the knee while you're applying some gentle medial pressure on the lateral patella. And when it gets straight, you kind of pop it over. And the reason to do that is we mentioned the patella has much more mobility and extension, and that's where you're least likely to cause damage. So get it straight, push it over when there's no groove there to really block it. Then you wanna put these patients in a knee immobilizer. You can let them weight bear as tolerated with crutches, but I recommend the knee be straight just for protection. And then I would recommend referring these patients for orthopedic consultation. So our treatment options, well, we can treat these without surgery. So that would be some short-term immobilization, protective bracing, physical therapy. We can also treat these by reconstructing that important ligament that I mentioned, that MPFL, because these are almost always torn or stretched out in every patella dislocation we see. The other thing we can consider doing is we can actually realign that tibial tubercle so I mentioned that some people's tibial tubercle is more laterally than we would like to see it. We can actually cut that, that part of the tibia, shift it over about a centimeter over into the medial direction, and then fix it with two screws, and that will help realign the patella better. So our first case is a 14-year-old female soccer player who hyperextended and twisted her right knee when she was practicing. As most of these do, this had self-reduced, but she felt fairly certain that that's what had happened. She felt her patella shift in and out. So on physical exam, I saw her pretty soon after her injury. So she had an effusion, so swelling in the knee. She lacked approximately 10 degrees of extension and had flexion to 110 degrees. Now, usually this is because of pain and swelling that they don't want to bend it and straighten it all the way. But you should always think about the possibility, could there be a loose body in the joint blocking their motion? So you never want to force them to bend or straighten it further. Most of these patients will have tenderness over the medial or inner side of the knee uh, because of that torn MPFL and the other tissues on the medial side of the knee get injured. Her cruciate collateral ligaments were normal. And then she had something called a patella apprehension test. So the person in this picture is actually showing a patella apprehension test. And what you do is you basically reproduce the kind of mechanism of a dislocation. You can see the rest of his hand is on the other side of her kneecap so that he won't dislocate it. But what you wanna know is does that patient get apprehensive when you're trying to push it out laterally? And if they do, that's a positive patella apprehension test because patients who recently dislocated their patella do not like that feeling. So her x-rays were unremarkable. Her MRI actually showed pretty much most of the pathognomonic findings that we look for uh, in a patella dislocation. So the first one is what we call a kissing lesion. So you can see the two arrows. Uh, the top one is pointing to the medial side of the patella and the other one on the left is pointing to the lateral femoral condyle. 
So if you think about it, when someone dislocates the patella, it basically goes all the way over, hits that bone of the femur before it pops back. So you get this kissing lesion because those two areas kissed each other. Um, and we see it on most acute patella dislocations. The other thing is, I don't know if John, if you can point to where you think the MPFL is, it's kind of, yeah. So it's that squiggly, all those squiggly black lines uh, going from the patella down towards the femur over there. That's the tear of the MPFL. And if you can see on the other side of the patella, there's a much more discrete black line, which is the lateral patellofemoral ligament. So you can clearly see the difference between the two. She actually had a normal trochlea groove. So her little V sulcus looked normal. There were no loose bodies. And when I measured the distance of her tibial tubercle, it was normal, it was less than 15. So how do we wanna manage this, excuse me? <clears throat> so there's both operative and non-operative treatment as we discussed. She's a first time dislocator. She has no loose bodies that I'm worried about causing damage. And she has no anatomic risk factors. She's got a normal trochlea groove and her tibial tubercle is in a normal position. So in, if we can go to the next slide. So my recommendation was non-operative treatment. Um, there can be some debate to this and we're gonna talk about why in a few minutes, but I recommended no surgery for these reasons. So for these patients, I'll put them in a knee immobilizer for to get down the pain and the inflammation and the swelling. And then I'll transition them into a patella stabilizing brace. There's a picture of one here. It's basically like a knee sleeve, but there's a little buttress over on the lateral side, which the patient's thumb is on. It's like a gel pad, which will support the lateral side of the patella so it can't shift. This gives the medial sided structures a chance to heal. And then I'll send these patients to physical therapy as well. They can often return to sports around three months once they have full motion, full strength, and a negative patella apprehension test. Our second case is a 19-year-old female who has a history of two prior patella dislocations who fell and dislocated her patella, once again self-reduced, so we didn't have to do anything for that. On physical exam, she actually came to me a few weeks afterwards because she was in Spain. She goes to college in Spain and her parents wanted her to come back here. I had seen her for another issue in the past. Um, so by the time I saw her, her swelling was better. She saw a trace effusion. She actually had full range of motion because the swelling and pain were, had gone down. She still had tenderness over the medial knee, again, because they do injure that medial patellofemoral ligament. Her other ligaments were stable and she had that patella apprehension test that we spoke about before. So her x-rays were also unremarkable. Uh, this gets pretty repetitive here with the MRIs, but we see the same thing. We see that kissing lesion of the medial patella and the lateral femoral condyle. There were no loose bodies. Her MPFL is actually continuous but it looks thinned, it looks a little stretched out to me. This is because she's torn it, healed it, torn it, healed it. So at this point, it, it's not even gonna tear, it's already stretched out. Um, she also does have a little bit of trochlear dysplasia. So while she has a little bit of a sulcus, it's not quite as deep as we would like to see it. And I measured her tibial tubercle and it was 16, which is just slightly above normal, but the very low end of the gray area. So it's pretty close to normal. So I recommended surgery, especially since this was her third offense, but what am I gonna do? So I can do an MPFL reconstruction, that's one option. Her MPFL is incompetent and she has some trochlea dysplasia. So both of those are indications to do an MPFL reconstruction. One, because it's incompetent, and two, because of her dysplasia, again, she needs that medial patellofemoral ligament to keep her in place while she's bending her knee until it engages further down. And then the next thing that we can consider is a tibial tubercle osteotomy. So she has a well-aligned tibial tubercle. So in my opinion, she does not need a tibial tubercle osteotomy. These are, the scope picture on the right is hers, but her pre-reconstruction um, pictures weren't good for what I could describe. So the, the piece uh, structure there is the patella, and then the F is the femur. So you can almost see the downslope of the patella is supposed to match in that groove on the end of the femur. 
but it's not close to it. It's about 50% over in the wrong direction. And this is pretty much what her knee looked like when I first went in there. You also should never have more than 10% of the patella hanging over the side of the femur. And she has about 50% here, so that's not normal. So the picture on the right is actually her knee after I did her MPFL reconstruction. And you can see how nicely the contours line up of the patella, which is up above, and then the trochlear groove, which is below. So that's you know, basically re-centralized her alignment or kept her in place. So getting to our third case, this is a 37-year-old male who fell on ice and dislocated his patella. Uh, once again, it's self-reduced, which is nice. So he had no prior dislocations, but he reported that he had multiple subluxations. So that's kind of like starts to dislocate, but doesn't quite get all the way out. And he actually had a lateral release in the past. So a lateral release is a procedure where you cut that lateral patellofemoral ligament. So you're basically trying to prevent the lateral pull on it. But unfortunately, this has been shown to not work for this problem. It's actually pretty antiquated to do as an isolated procedure. And so most people have really, um, you know, don't do that anymore uh, on its own. So of course it didn't work for him. So on physical exam for him, he had a very large effusion. He had significantly limited range of motion. He had that tenderness over the medial knee. His other ligaments were all stable. He had a patella apprehension test. And um, Jonathan, if you can wait before you change the slide, describe this because the video is pretty quick. Um, he had something that's called a J sign. So a J sign is when your patella is so malaligned that when your knee is straight, it's sitting way off to the outer or lateral side. So when you go to bend your knee and it gets pulled into the trochlear groove, it's pretty dramatic and it forms the shape of like an inverted J. So if you go to the next slide, I have a video showing a J sign. It's actually pretty, um, <laughs> takes you aback the first time you see it. So here his knee's straight. And then when he bends it, it gets pulled over into that groove. So, and it's, it's uncomfortable for patients to feel that. And one more time, <laughs> gets pulled over into the groove. So now it's centered, now it's not. And now it's centered again. All right, next slide. All right, so his x-rays did actually show some subtle loose bodies in the back of the knee, which is actually not um, you know, unexpected given all of his subluxations. His MRI, once again, uh, this job is easy. It's the same over and over. He's got that typical kissing lesion, bone bruise. Um, he's got mild trochlear dysplasia or mild to moderate. So his trochlear groove is flatter than we like to see it. His MPFL is not very distinct. Um, so it's just, you don't see that nice line along the medial patellofemoral ligament. His tibial tubercle to trochlear groove distance, so remember that's the measurement of how far lateral is his tibial tubercle, was 22. Tw anything above 20 is considered abnormal. And then it also confirmed he had small loose bodies in the back of the knee. We don't generally worry about those because they kind of stay in the back of the knee and don't usually ever come back out. So for him, I recommended surgery, but what was I gonna do? So what's, what about an MPFL reconstruction? Well, he does have a tear of his MPFL and he does have some mild trochlear dysplasia. And as you've heard already, both of those are indications for an MPFL reconstruction. And then what about a tibial tubercle osteotomy? So he does have um, his tibial tubercle way too lateral because of that measurement is way too high. And then he has that J sign. So the reason the J sign is an indication for a tibial tubercle osteotomy is because his alignment is just so far off. You basically want to throw everything at it to try to get him recentered. Um, so that is also an indication to do both an MPFL and a tibial tubercle osteotomy. This is a after picture. So the top right picture is an arthroscopy after I finished his surgery. He's well centered. You can kind of see the contour alignment of the patella and the trochlea. What's not great is if the, you look at the actual patella, on the right of that picture, you can see this like yellow shiny stuff. And then on the left, it looks almost like mottled with some reddish. That's actually where he's lost cartilage. 
whereas the very far right of his patella is actually normal cartilage. So you can kind of see the difference. Um, you know, he was so diffuse. There are some cartilage transfer procedures he could consider, um, but you know, that would be if he had issues in the future. And then the bottom left picture is him five months after his uh, tibial tubercle osteotomy. So you can see those two screws that I put in after I moved his tubercle over. Most people actually like to get those taken out, but you don't have to. It just bothers them in the front of the knee because they're pretty superficial. So other considerations, why would we do surgery? Well, if someone has a big loose body and that yellow arrow is pointing at a big loose body, you don't, you can, you don't wanna leave that in there. It's gonna float around, it can cause damage to the knee. And plus you might be able to reattach it and save their cartilage or bone. So you can either reattach those or you can remove them if they're not fixable. And while you're in there, it just makes sense to address their instability at the same time. They're already undergoing surgery. So having a loose body is a reason to do surgery. Um, also patient preference. When we did the first case, I told you that there was some debate about me recommending um, non-surgical management for that patient. And the reason for that is because 15 to 50% of first time dislocators will re-dislocate. That's a pretty high number. Now that number does lump in all patients who could have um, lateral tubercles or trochlear dysplasia. So it doesn't really represent our patient individually. So her number is probably, you know, kind of on the lower end of that range. Um, but she is a female under 20, and they also are the highest risk as far as demographics for who will become recurrent dislocators. And that's a conversation I always have with my patients. I tell them, I recommend you, you know, give this one a buy, and if it happens again, you fix it. But here's the real deal. You might happen, it might happen again. And I go over the option of just fixing it if they have a strong preference. So some take home points, if it didn't self reduce, reduce it, slowly extend the knee, some gentle medial projected pressure when it's near, near full extension, you'll feel it pop back in, initially immobilize and refer for orthopedic consult. Absolute indication for surgery, a big loose body floating around, you got to get it out. And then, like I said, probably just do the stabilization at the same time. Relative indications, someone who's dislocated more than once, I think should have surgery. First time dislocators who have bony alignment, so such as a lateral tubercle or trochlear dysplasia should really give it good consideration. And then a possible indication would be patient preference. It's not unreasonable to operate on first time dislocators. It's just a conversation you have to have with the patient and or their parents. So if surgery, what? If their MPL is incompetent, reconstruct it. If they're dysplastic in their trochlea, reconstruct that ligament as well. If they have an abnormal position of the tubercle, well then move it medial with a tibial tubercle osteotomy. So just again, I'm part of Newton Wellesley Orthopedic Associates. Those are our locations. That's our referral information. Lori, thanks for such a great review. Um, I wondered uh, if you can comment on uh, the person who comes in, because we're not likely in the office to see that acute setting, although that was pretty cool reducing that patella. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that we're likely to see in the next day in our office. Uh, would you suggest um, from a primary care point of view, just putting in a mobilizer go non-weight bearing and send him along at that point for, uh, for that first point of contact? Yeah, so um, I would say a knee immobilizer, as long as their leg is straight, you actually can let them weight bear as tolerated. So there's no stress on the patellofemoral joint if the patient's in full extension. If you can't get their knee straight, you could either just put them in a hinge brace to make them feel better. And that also will have usually a little lateral support. Um, but if you can't brace them, then I keep them non-weight bearing. They're not gonna dislocate the patella again if they're just non-weight bearing with a flexed knee. And then, and then how do you, so the ones who don't require, don't want surgery after the first one, and they're still playing uh, uh, pivot sports or stop start sports, do you recommend a certain kind of bracing or is that all? That's a really good, good question. So there are braces that are made specifically for people with patella instability. Uh, Don Joy makes a nice one called the, actually the picture I showed was a Don Joy brace. They have the true, um, the true light pull, true pull, true pull light brace. The true pull is their like post injury one. It's a little bigger, a little more supportive. And then the light version is their one for sports. So yes, I do actually fit my patients for this. The question is how long do they need to use it? 
I mean, I tell them if it doesn't bother them, use it indefinitely. If they don't like playing with it, you know, maybe after a year or two, if they want to see how it goes without it. But it is a little bit of an insurance when they're playing because it does have that lateral buttress there. Okay. And I, I guess I'll take advantage. Nobody's asking questions. I'll ask one more question. So do these patients who have hypermobile needs but don't dislocate um, and we see a lot of this in our office, obviously, with, with patellofemoral pain syndrome or chondromalacia. Um, any other advice? I mean, obviously, are they at increased risk for dislocation? Should we be um, telling them about these kinds of braces or just be dealing with PFPS like we typically do? I mean, I guess it depends if you're talking about somebody with like, you know, Ehlers-Danlos, yes, they're going to have hypermobility. If they feel symptomatic, then sure, you can give them that brace. The only problem with them is they're probably hypermobile medially as well. And so something like there, they might do better with just like a patella, like supportive sleeve, you know, that has that circle around it. Sure. Yeah. Because unfortunately, you're not going to have a good way to stabilize their knee. And surgery really has poor outcomes in people with connective tissue disorders. But if there's someone who's just a subluxer, and that's going to be a lateral directed um, issue, then yeah, you can recommend they get like a patella buttress brace and really PT to strengthen their glute and quads to keep that patella, you know, as straight as you can. Excellent. Laurie, thank you so much. A really clear talk, really helpful. Um, and uh, again, uh, Laurie is part of Newton Wellesley Orthopedic Associates, long time big group here at our Newton Wellesley Hospital. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great day and a really great weekend. And we'll see you all next week for some uh, for our shoulder talk. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.